This program is brought to you by Emory University. We're currently defining a habitable zone, and the habitable zone around a star is that, that region of distance from the star where water can exist as a liquid. Um, water can ex either exist on the planet, for example, on Mercury, it's clearly too hot for water to exist, and uh, for uh, things distant uh, like Pluto, which is a no longer on the planet, <laughs> uh, it's uh, frozen. Um, and so for for the biochemistry that we understand now, it really is dependent on working in liquid water. Um, but certainly that's just the biochemistry we know now. We change that chemistry ever so slightly and there still could be self-organizing, uh, self-replicating, evolving systems that could occur on other planets. So you can envision very dry, arid environments like the, the desert, and even within those environments there are there are forms of life but they're still water based it's just that they're uh, the time frame in which they do the chemistry that they do is slow is has to slow down so then they have to manifest the ability to do that in ways that don't allow them that keep them from falling apart so they can still do what they need to do without decaying and so that, that you know I think that's kind of an oddly enough represented in a movie by suspended animation, right? How do you slow down biochemistry enough that you allow an organism, humans in this case, to remain viable, uh, both in terms of their biochemistry and their physiology and their neurology and their psyches, right? So I mean, now you're taking a, a sentient being and you're freezing them down. Think about what happens from a neurological perspective. Prometheus really plays on this because they have interst interstellar travel, right? So then there's no habitable zone between the stars in that way. And yet, they travel there. You have to be able to train. You can't leapfrog. You're tr basically transiting zones that don't allow for life to occur. But or yeah. support. I mean, the, the other thing is that why would they be so far away? Is it just a probability argument? I mean, well, that's the fundamental to the Kepler. There, there, there are more suns in the universe than there are uh, grains of sand on Earth. And if each sun has uh, several planets, I mean, the probability that it has to be out there. There has to be another spot where this chemical network you're talking about exists. As we understand water on this planet, it, it actually came from extracellular sources. It came from comets that uh, continued to crash into Earth. And then huge concern about trying to differentiate between what was on that meteorite and what was contaminated from Earth after it landed. So this concept of what comes from extracellular sources, what comes from within the planetary system within our solar system and what existed here before is always a debate and a concern about anyone trying to understand that process. And the same is going to be true when we go to another planet. What do we take with us? We know that bacteria are within us all the time. We're, we're, we think of ourselves as being human, but we're mostly bacterial communities. And when we go to another planet, we take those communities with us and how are we going to make sure that we're not seeding other... Well, and we can't strip that away because not only, <coughs> excuse me, are we in part bacterial communities, but we are codependent on those bacterial yeah. communities. Absolutely. It's symbiotic. Yeah, absolutely. So it isn't as though we can just strip them out and say, well, we're going to leave all those behind and then go as a pristine, pure, unadulterated, sterile organism to another planet. It just doesn't work that way. And it's intriguing to think about that from the premise of the movie in the sense that you know, this idea that they, they leave star maps for humans to find, we get to some point in our evolution where we begin to understand that there's, you know, there's this potential outside of us, outside of our realm. I mean, we talked about chemical networks, you could think about that at an interstellar level, right? That there's one source of chemistry here, another source of chemistry on another planet. How do those different networks interact? In this case, you know, the engineers come here and they see things, then we go back there. But as we do that, do we become our own biological weapons, if you will, against another species? These other environments, if they're pristine, that is to say uncontaminated by uh, a biological signature that exists here on Earth, then is there the potential that we can contaminate that as much as we can be contaminated by? So uh, by sources of uh, organic material, uh, 
remnants of, bio, of other extraterrestrial biochemistries that come here to Earth. And this is the argument behind some of these carbonaceous meteorites that have struck the Earth over eons, the possibility that they provided seed substances that would help sort of in an autocatalytic manner generate more of the same that would lead to biochemistry we see here. Conversely, when NASA sends out missions to other planets, other moons, and so forth, they have to be uh, critically aware of the fact that the instruments, the platforms they're sending, have to be free of contamination of, of biological materials from here on Earth. Both in terms of their ability to understand what is actually on a planet like Mars, that isn't something they brought with them, but rather something that's truly there, and also because it's an ethical concern, which is you don't want to contaminate another if at all possible. So it's kind of intriguing to think about that too. And of course, history's full of that. Well, and yes, and you know, even here on Earth, there's the argument about what's going on below the, the, the glacial crust in Antarctica, and that there's these, these pristine lakes that exist below the surface that, you know, there are various countries now that are trying to drill down into these to see what's going on down there. And the argument too there is, are we running the risk of contaminating these pristine environments with surface biochemistry, and how do we go about doing that so we don't? So we can actually see what's there and not change it, uh, and not adulterate it. You know, what, would the, what would alternative chemistries look like, and what elements could they you know, manifest from? And the fact of the matter is that, again, if you accept that these elements are pretty much ubiquitous in the universe in varying ratios and well, concentrations. They are, right? Because they're made from suns. They're made from the Big Bang and um, ultimately, then when we understand their physical properties, we know that these elements towards the bottom of the periodic table are highly unstable and less likely, uh, they're rare for one thing, they're highly unstable, they're probably less likely to manifest the uh, hybridization, if you will, that forms the kinds of bonds that lead to larger molecules. And the larger molecules contain more information and that information manifests in biochemistry, genetic information, the chemical evolution. Um, that's the wondrous nature of carbon. It is so good at that because of its stability, its reactivity, its particular uh, uh, atomic hybridization leads to all of that. That's why it's germane to our chemistry and it's probably going to be a fundamental nature of chemistry in other, other worlds, given its availability in the right conditions. One way to imagine the universe that we have is that there was a huge explosion that spewed everything out, and that's how things got distributed the way that they did. And if there was one force of an explosion that distributed everything out, then it should be slowing down, right? There should be some gravity, or at least if there's no gravitational pull between them, it should maintain the same velocity that it had before. But it doesn't, it's accelerating. All the data that we've got now suggests that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. So it's not to say that there wasn't a Big Bang, it's to say that there's another component that we didn't imagine before that's out there that's controlling it. Now, there are lots of theories. There's theories about multiple universes. There's another gravitational force out there that we can't see that's out there pulling it. Um, uh, there's something about dark matter that's affecting the way the, the universe is expanding and growing that we don't yet understand. So, but with every scientific discipline, there are these facts that we've got and there are these holes that we don't have that we're trying to understand and we're trying to put the pieces together. And it's, that's why we're all saying what's so marvelous about mystery and imagination and storytelling because it helps us design the experiment. So what if it was this way? And science fiction does a beautiful job of, you know, foretelling some of the technology that we develop because there are a few pieces of evidence and if you change this one, then all of a sudden man can fly, right? That'd be pretty remarkable. Or all of a sudden we can have something that can go to the bottom of the ocean. And all of a sudden we have something that can go to the moon, right? And these things are hard to fathom until they happen. Or we could sail across the ocean and find another continent. You know, all these things are you know, hard thinking back at the time and the technology and the data set that people had at the time, trying to put together these pieces of who in their right mind would get in a boat and sail out there, right? Because you'd never come back. Um, that's sort of what makes it so magical. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.